Hi, welcome back to a new video. This is gonna be my March wrap up for all the books I've read this month and yeah, like my general thoughts on them. Um, thanks so much for returning if you're a subscriber already, but if you're new here, I met and I post about bookish content uh, and I talk about the books I, I've read and what I think about them and the things that I've learned from them. And um, if you've watched my Feb wrap up, I only read like three, four books in that month, and so that was about about that was about a book a week, and that was like a pretty manageable pace for me. Um, but I think this month I read a lot more books. Um, I don't necessarily think it's a good thing. I think that there were a lot of things happening again <laughs> in my personal life that felt. Um, that kind of made me want to reach out to books a bit more. So I don't know whether it was like an escapism mechanism, like whether it was like a kind of like, let me just distract myself from these things that are happening in my life, or whether it was like a sincere attempt at trying to um, fill up voids or find answers for the things that I was struggling with. So I wasn't too sure about that motivation, reflecting a lot about that now. Um, what really motivated me to read all these books in March. But anyway, um, let's just start with the books. And I've got quite a range of books, actually. So the first book that I finished reading was We Make Spaces Divine by Pooja Nancy. Um, if you're from Singapore, you might have heard of her before. She's a playwright, um, poet, as I think poet first and a playwright. Um, who has done quite a lot of work here in Singapore. I remember there was a play that she wrote and acted in as well that was Thick Beats for Good Girls and I really enjoyed that play. And yeah, I've been seeing this poetry collection pop up around in you know the local bookstagram communities. I wanted to read it. So I did read uh, a library copy. Um, I think most of the books I read this month were library copies and so I read that as a library copy, I finished it in about an hour or two, pretty fast, since it was a, just a collection. And yeah, I really, really enjoyed it. I do think that, um, I think poetry sometimes can be a hit, a hit or miss, depending on like, because it's usually a very local and very... Usually it's, there's a lot of more local references. It might not really have that kind of like... I don't know, global, international appeal. I, but I really, really enjoyed Pooja Nancy's work. It's like this celebration of her time when she was young and figured, like, you know, finding her place, uh, her Desi identity as well, like in Singapore and paying tribute to these places that made her and this sense of like joy and liberation, uh, as well as these tensions that come from being a, a immigrant family, uh, which you know, to some degree, I, I resonate to as well, resonate with as well. So um, I I think after reading this book, I do want to kind of, you know, expand on my understanding of what it means to be like a first-gen Singaporean here as well, because, um, yeah, I, I'm a first-gen, and it's, you know, later on in my life that I got a citizenship, and that's always been... A question in my head, like, you know, what does it mean to naturalize as a Singaporean identity? Um, what does it mean to kind of like have your multicultural self being molded into something that's a lot more mainstream? That's something I always struggle with. Um, but I don't want to go too deep into that because, you know, <laughs> the politics in Singapore can be pretty like hard to dissect and I don't think that's you know the scope of this video so I'm not gonna go into that but anyway <laughs> the second book that I went into is quite different it's uh, Glitch Feminism by Legacy Russell um, a manifesto by Legacy Russell so this is a book I saw quite a lot on people's instas like generally um, more of the international bookstagram community that were talk that was talking about this book in particular and um if you watch my fat wrap up i did do i did read this bo uh, book called how to do nothing and it was about the attention economy and so it was kind of like a call to resist the attention economy but i wanted to have a bit more of like a more nuanced understanding of the whole thing because i don't think it's kind of i don't think it's like a full picture if you just say resist the attention economy resist technology and resist um, the ways that, you know, um, we use the digital realm. Um, so Legacy Russell, I really enjoy this book. It's really manifesto style. So a lot of like, 
um, how do I say this feeling of uh, inspiration, this feeling of like, um, let's subvert, you know, let's um, take up space, let's find enormous potential in these little glitches um, that we see in the internet. And I think the takeaway was really to see the concept of a glitch, not just in the digital realm, and uh, but also in the away from keyboard world. So the digital world and the non-digital world uh, are so intertwined right now. And there are certain kind of modes of resistance that we can learn from being online, that we can apply to who we are in our bodies, in our like literal bodies. And I think that's so interesting because this book was primarily written um, as a manifesto to go against the gender binary. So it's uh, more of like resisting this binary and being um, Ill- illegible by the system, yet highly visible. Um, so that was the key takeaway from, for me. Um, and I think a lot of the concepts are pretty, I would say pretty radical in some senses, which I would still take some time to process, but I definitely shifted my ideas on digital, on the digital and the tech a little bit more towards like, you know, a, a tool for change and a tool for resistance rather than co-opting out of it entirely. So instead of just like um, getting out of it or, or to re- to say no, it's about how do you say no strategically? How do you um, make yourself, how do you use the tools of the internet for your own kind of like to to advocate for the interests of the people who are usually left out of main discourse and mainstream like narratives. So how do you use the precise tools of the internet to to subvert that whole thing, which is pretty interesting. Uh, And this book definitely talks a lot about that. So if you're interested in that, um, would recommend the book, but it is really more on the, yeah, like radical feminism kind of rhetoric, (laughs) I can't pronounce it, rhetoric. So you might not understand it much if you are completely new to it but I think it's quite a worthy read overall. The third book that I read was Take Care of Yourself, The Art and Cultures of Care and Liberation by Sundus Abdul Hadi. This is a really good book. I did talk about it a little bit in my previous video talking about um, books on on healing, care and uh, trauma and all that. So this was the book that really kick-started that whole like idea um because i've always been interested in you know i've always been interested in uh you things like social progress and and stuff like that but it was always very hard for me to articulate um where i would fit into that and i also still think that i'm trying to figure out um what is the best way for me to contribute and what is the best way for me to to act you know while still protecting uh my mental health reserves and my well-being so this book was really 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 helpful in that and um, I'm not going to go too much into detail but it's really about um, how do you build communities of care especially from the margins and how do you advocate you know a kind of how do you advocate for kind of this transformative potential that's through um, caring for your community and, but that also has to stem from a caring of yourself and self-care as a concept how do we decolonize it how do we make sure that it is um, allowing you to heal without damaging other people or without appropriating from other people so I, I think it's such a relevant book and I'm surprised that I haven't really seen it anywhere other than the bookstore that I picked it up from, which is Wada Books here in Singapore. But I've not actually seen this book anywhere else. Um, but it, I really recommend the book. I really, really enjoyed it. After that, I did read a short story collection called Track Faults and Other Glitches, um, Stories of the Impossible in Singapore by Nicholas Young. So this is a short story collection that was recommended to me by a friend. Um, and yeah, I was just I was just really blown away, honestly. Um, when I was reading this book, I read it over a course of like three days. And th- during those tr- three days, I had really vivid dreams. Like I would have two or three dreams in the night and I would wake up and be like, what the heck just happened, you know? Because <laughs> I think... The author, Nicholas Yeo, has has such a particular way of depicting Singaporean situations 
but with a very good serving of um the uncanny of a bit of horror here and there very fanta- fantasy sort of thing but yet still informed by the local kind of cultural nuances and by the local folklore um and all of that which was really cool to me because um it, this the language is still straightforward the language is still simple and accessible i think that's the most important in storytelling is that you want to have a story with its most basic elements but has like this impact you know i mean you don't have you don't have to have fanciful words to make a story compelling so i i think i think this story this short short story collection is pretty solid i i realize that there are quite a lot of solid compilations of short stories but this one in particular is by one author um and i think it's really cool i'm i'm really glad i picked it up and it was a very I feel like nowadays I'm getting a sense of like oh actually I, I quite enjoy um sing lit in terms of like short story um style format so I I might read more of that and then see if I can find other genres that might have parts that you know I resonate with because usually I will only read Singapore nonfiction so this is like new territory but I'm really enjoying it I think yeah really good short story collection. So the next book that I finished reading was a career book <laughs> and it's The Multi-Hyphen Method by Emma Gannon. Uh it's yeah, it's really just a career book that's about having a multi-hyphenated career. So like you you could be a creative entrepreneur that has started up something, has like, you know, um running something that is part-time I don't know, lecturing that is, you know, doing part-time this. So basically just many different job titles. And obviously this is as, I think, as bland as you can go uh, with career books. But as I mentioned at the start of the video, I was at a kind of um, juncture where I was really struggling a lot with, um, yeah, like how am I supposed to pivot my career? How am I supposed to... Uh, identify my skill sets and apply them and unfortunately with as much social theory in my head with as much nuance that I can pack into whatever content I put out there unfortunately like I still need to brush up on you know corporate language and to brush up on how to be legible by an, a big enough audience so that I can make a living you know because I because I think there has to be some kind of balance in between that. I think nowadays I realize that it's not very good to just stick to one particular mindset, but to have a flexible mindset. But in terms of my, of my own personal growth, like, you know, all these things can look very different to different people. And depending on who I talk to, my progress and my trajectory might look very different, might reach different standards, etc. So this book, I would say it's very much, um, I think it's pretty practical. I mean, obviously it doesn't account for like um, differences in um, social capita or like starting capita. It definitely doesn't make a difference between the countries. This is primarily for a US, UK audience. It doesn't make a difference between like, you know, what are the opportunities presented to you based on your um, upbringing and your status and your social position in society. So obviously this book doesn't address that. Um, I would be more surprised if it did. Um, nonetheless, I do think that um, generally this book would fall into the category of like what, how are we supposed to prepare ourselves for the future job economy? How are we supposed to make sure that um, we are all prepared to shift towards you know, a more flexible working style and environment? Um, and I, I don't think this book offers any answers that you can't already find out there and ha- has been discussed in more mainstream media. I don't think this book says anything new, but it was a good reminder to figure out, to put more effort into like figuring out the language that is more, has more mass appeal or figuring out ways to market myself, you know, personal branding, neoliberalism. I mean, it's, it's part of, part and parcel, I guess, of putting your stuff out there. So, yeah, I mean, am I proud for reading this book? I mean, I, I don't know, but I did read it. So this is a wrap up and I did read it. So this book, is, this video is becoming like a rambling 
rambling video and not actually a wrap-up video. Moving on, the next book I read was A Fueled Guide to Climate Anxiety, um, How to Keep Your Cool on a Warming Planet by Sarah Jacket Ray. Um, this is a good book. I would say that it is a lot more about... It's more targeted towards younger people and it definitely targets a more a systemic view towards things so it's not just addressing like oh, okay individual efforts what you can do but rather like addressing the fact that you know overall structures of capitalism and of imperialism are like inherently power hungry and inherently exploitative and this book's supposed to help you like you know um dig it deeper into yourself and to find a social justice framework that is centered on collective transformation that's centered on on like you know change on all levels and i really like how the author also wanted to also emphasize a lot about what activism might look like differently i think there's there was this one really important takeaway which was that you know um words tend to have certain polarizing reactions for example if you say you're a climate activist um, or if you're a feminist um, and, and things like that people can have really different reactions to those labels um, but the point is that everyone is working towards good so the example that was given was that if you see a farmer you know in rural america for example who is um, really against like climate change rhetoric like you know this farmer totally doesn't believe it you know has a huge skepticism towards scientific research but is working really hard to have a diversity of crops I think there's a term for it um, but to also regenerate the soil and to work towards um, you know making making farming a lot more sustainable so in the end this farmer is also working towards um, the same goal which is to um, improve the environment and to make sure that food security is there to make sure that the planet is not going to, do to doom so um, this farmer has the same intention so but using the word climate crisis or climate activists might you know invite more of a polarizing discussion rather than a collaborative one so i don't think the author is saying that you discount the labels right away but rather to place the efforts and the actions first and then not to focus too much on the labels and focus on yeah like collaborating and bringing together um changes on every possible level that you can have and this is like pretty mind-changing from not mind-changing like it's a pretty important mindset shift for me i think that I think that for myself, like I've had some encounters with the fact that activism might look a certain way, but it might it might not look a certain way. Um, when you think about if everyone is working towards change and progress. The very last book that I read, um, which I just finished today, was The Future We Choose: Surviving the Climate Crisis by Christiana Figueres and Tom Rivet Carnock. This is a book that I also recommended in my books on climate change. I think after reading the entire book, um, I would say that it's a good starting point uh, for anyone who might be interested in a more like balanced and updated understanding of like broad, broadly what climate, what the climate movement entails. And um, I wouldn't say that it's, yeah, I would say that it's really quite general and quite broad and it's a worthy like dense, dense read for a primer in climate change and they do cover quite a few topics as well and I guess the main topic so I think the problem with books and general like you know concentrated bits of information is that there's going to be some parts that you leave out and I think for this book um, they wanted to focus on you know the most visible areas that you know the climate movement can work on and which is you know like things like investing in clean energy things like empowering uh women leaders at every front because they tend to also bring very good solutions to the movement and unfortunately a lot of world leaders today like the summits and conferences are still dominated by men and so they focus on those points and i i didn't really quite like the ending surprisingly the conclusion was very still very much like individualistic so it was about things like like having to vote with your money and yes i think personally i think if everyone did uh do something small if everyone did it if, if everyone does commit to um living a more like environmentally friendly life and are, is com 
and are committed to the climate movement, I do think that there can be a pretty substantial shift. Um, but I'm also a bit skeptical of that because I also do think that a lot of people are mobilized a lot more uh, when it comes from the authority and when it's mandated or legalized. And unfortunately, like in a context like Singapore, it is very, very hard to get a political movement moving forward. And so like here, a lot of the sustainability talk and, and, and equal f- kind of climate movement talk is still very... Like, I would say it's still very much on the individual thing, like, you know, use less plastic straws, etc. Um, when the author did talk about, like, having to mobilise, um, you know, having civil disobedience, it is a pretty difficult topic to broach here in Singapore. So I'm kind of struggling with that. Like, I'm wondering what would be the equivalent and what would be the actions that we can take within the boxes that we have here in Singapore, which I guess would be like writing letters, you know, MP and, you know, showing up at events and um, just having all these conversations. Uh, yeah, I, I guess to me, this is also kind of like a wake up call to try and push myself a little bit further in the kind of political actions I can take. But uh, I think that this is something that the author, the authors, it is very you know, encouraging in the US context, but has to be applied a little bit differently here. Anyway, that is um, all the books I'm, I've am i read in March. I'm currently reading Malay Sketches by Alfian Sa'ad, so I think I would be done with that soon because I'm actually recording this on the 30th to be up later on in April. But yeah, I just thought that I would film it now because I, I don't have, you know, a lot of... I mean, it's a good opportunity to just film it now. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so that is my wrap up for March as you can tell I did read quite a lot of books um, surprisingly and definitely a lot, of, a lot of books that I didn't expect to be reading but I did finish um, yeah so let me know what you think of the books that I've read um, and what you think of what I've said in general I do want to move towards more featuring more Singaporean and Southeast Asian books in general not just non fic but fiction as well um, I think I've still been reading too much um, like social theory and, and political commentary from overseas and I'm finding it very difficult to relate it to the context here so I will definitely move towards more of that uh, in the future months. So thanks so much for tuning in all the way. I mean, staying all the way to the end of the video. Um, yeah, and thanks so much. Um, I guess I'll see you soon in the next video. And yeah, cool. Bye.